Hello there, and a very warm welcome to this podcast all about anemia. This is the first of three podcasts in the haematology section, and is going to be about the really, really big topic of anemia. In haematology, as a medical student, there really are three big categories that you need to know about. Anemia is one of these. Uh, the other two are bleeding disorders and haematological malignancy. And hopefully in these three podcasts, you're going to get a really good overview and a framework on which to base the rest of your learning. So let's get on with it. Let's talk a little bit about anemia. Let's start by defining anemia. What exactly is anemia? Well, Anemia can be defined as a haemoglobin that's less than the reference range for an individual. Obviously, different labs, different hospitals will have different reference ranges, but generally it's worth learning two figures. For men, an anemia would be less than 13.5, and for women, less than 11.5. Note also that an anemia is usually accompanied by a reduction in red cell mass. The exception to this, however, is in pregnancy, where you see both an uh, increase in uh, the red cell mass and also the plasma volume. The reason anemia occurs, uh, or is more common certainly, is because there is a relative increase in plasma volume more than that in the red cell mass. So overall the concentration is slightly less. What about the clinical features of anemia in general? Um, now, first thing worth saying here is that this is just in general. Um, anemia itself is mostly asymptomatic, but uh, if there is severe or coexistent disease, often coexistent cardiac or pulmonary disease, symptoms can be quite severe. These include lethargy, breathlessness, and precipitation of any underlying conditions, such as uh, ischemic heart disease causing angina, peripheral vascular disease causing intermittent claudication. There also may be symptoms of one of the underlying causes of anemia, such as uh, malignancy. In terms of signs, the most common one is probably conjunctival pallor. However, it's certainly not recommended that you exclude anemia based upon the absence of this sign. Other signs that are particularly associated with certain types of anemia, but it's worth being aware of at this stage, are things such as cholinicia, that's uh, spoon-shaped nails, atrophic glossitis, that's a red, large, swollen tongue, angular stomatitis, which is fissuring at the corners of the mouth, features of a hyperdynamic circulation, which is a compensatory mechanism for an anemia, including a high-flow murmur or a tachycardia, and then very rarely dysphagia because of a pharyngeal web. So let's get on now to talking about the classification of anemia. Essentially, there are two ways to classify anemia. The one that you're probably most familiar with, and the one that certainly you'll see clinicians using quite a lot of the time, is the classification by red cell size. So this is uh, microcytic small cells, normocytic normally sized cells, and macrocytic large cells. Now, um, under each of these I've given a list, and these are probably the most common causes that fit into each of these categories, and is something that you may wish, as you progress in your medical learning, to memorise. For the purposes of this clinical pathology podcast, on the other hand, I want to consider things from a little bit more of a pathophysiological point of view. So I want to look at anemia in terms of anemia due to reduced production of red cells. Um, that could be because, say, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the nutrients that uh, are needed to produce red cells are not available, or because perhaps the, the machinery that's producing the red cells is in some way um, disturbed. You can also have anemia due to reduced lifespan of the blood cells, so there's no problem in actually producing these cells, but once they're out there, they are in some way uh, phagocytosed or destroyed, and this is where we really see uh, hemolysis coming in. And finally, you can have another group due to pooling, such as in splenomegaly. Let's start by looking at anemia due to reduced production. Essentially, you can have reduced production because there is either insufficient production or there is inefficient production. In insufficient production there are not enough of the core elements available to produce red cells and this is what is broadly 
defined as hematinic deficiency. And the crucial hematinics that you need to know about are iron, vitamin B12 and folate. And deficiencies of different ones can cause different types of anemia. In inefficient production, there is some problem that, with the machinery that's producing the red blood cells. And this is commonly seen in uh, bone marrow infiltration or myelodysplasia. Let's first go through insufficient production, which is due to lack of those core materials of iron folate and vitamin B12. Iron deficiency anemia is probably the most common type of anemia. And it's really, really important, therefore, to get a grasp on this. In terms of some basic facts, the amount of iron that's required per day is one milligram for a normal adult, two milligrams for a menstruating female, and three milligrams in pregnancy due to obvious increased requirements. The Western diet affords between 10 to 20 milligrams per day, as long as the right foods are eaten, um, but only one third of this is absorbed. It's also important to know that the main store of iron in the body is actually in the red cells themselves. But there is an additional store in the liver in the form of both ferritin and hemosiderin, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Once again, we can take a very simple, logical approach to iron deficiency anemia. We can say, well, why is there a deficiency of iron? This could be because of reduced intake, so in malnutrition. It could be because there is a relative lack of intake due to increased demand, for example, during pregnancy or, say, during childhood, such as in pubertal growth spurts. We could say that the iron's being taken in okay, but it's not being absorbed. And the key site of absorption is the duodenum. So we commonly see uh, malabsorption iron deficiency anemia in celiac disease and post-gastrectomy. Finally, and very importantly, we can see uh, an iron deficiency anemia when the main store of iron is lost from the body. And as the main store is in red cells, we see this in blood loss. And we're going to go on to talk about that now. So as alluded to, the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia is simply blood loss. If you take into account that one mil of blood contains 0.5 milligrams of iron, you will appreciate that if this blood loss is continuing, then you're going to deplete your stores and enter a sort of negative balance situation quite quickly, where you're unable to take in enough iron in your diet to maintain sufficient um, stores. And in fact, daily loss of even up to 10 mils of blood is enough to cause this negative balance. In terms of usual sites, the most common sites of blood loss are the uterus in menstruating women and the GI tract. And in the GI tract, always remember that the upper GI tract is three times more common as the site of source of blood loss in iron deficiency anemia than the lower GI tract. So what about the blood panel? You suspect someone have, might have an iron deficiency anemia, so you send off a blood panel. What might you find? Well, first of all, HB is going to be low. That's the definition of anemia. As alluded to earlier, the MCV, the mean cell volume, is going to be low. And the mean cell volume is one of those things that you need to try and remember, have a figure for. And I tend to remember the figure of 80 for the lower end. Ferritin is one of the key stores of iron in the in the body um, and can be measured in the lab and will usually be low. However, the problem with ferritin is, is, is that it's something called an acute phase reactant. That means if there's any inflammation going on, any infection, malignancy, then this uh, the levels of this, uh, this substance can be increased. Therefore, um, in an anemia where perhaps we were considering a differential diagnosis of malignancy, the ferritin may not be very useful diagnostically because it may be raised. Therefore, we can also look at the serum iron and the total iron binding capacity. And we'll often find that the serum iron is low and the total iron binding capacity is high. And this is a sort of third line test for iron deficiency anemia. We may also look at the blood film. And there are four particular abnormalities that you should be aware of on the blood film. So first of all, microcytic cells, so that's small cells. Hypochromic cells, so that's cells that aren't or have this sort of very central area of, of pallor. 
also cells that vary in their size and their shape as seen on this slide. Variation in size is called anisocytosis and variation in shape is called poikilocytosis. Anemia itself is not a diagnosis. It requires further investigation until a cause is found because, for example, if there's an ongoing source of blood loss, you need to treat that to prevent iron deficiency anemia coming back. So, for example, in an elderly gentleman, perhaps who pre presents with an, anemia, with an anemia, you're going to think mainly about GI source, perhaps upper GI or lower GI. So these, this group of patients will typically, once they've had their iron deficiency anemia confirmed, go on to have um, upper uh, GI endoscopy and lower GI endoscopy to look for a possible source of blood loss. Once you've found the source and treated the source, you want to obviously replenish the supplies of iron. And you can do this in a number of different ways. Most commonly, you do it with an oral medication called ferrous sulfate. And you continue that three months after the hemoglobin is returned to normal. However, sometimes ferrous sulfate can have um, some side effects, such as abdominal pain, constipation. Some patients really don't tolerate this very well. And if there is poor tolerance of oral iron and, and you really, really do need to replenish the stores for clinical reasons, then you can consider using parenteral iron, such as iron sorbitol and iron sucrose. However, to be fair, this is, tends not to be done so much. And then finally, you, one can also consider in extremis using a uh, red cell transfusion. Okay, so we've looked a little bit at iron. That was one of our key hematinics. Let's go on now to look at the group called megaloblastic anemias that tend to be caused by reduced vitamin B12 and reduced folate. However, the first thing I want to say about this is that macrocytosis is not absolutely equal to megaloblastic anemia. Megaloblasts are indeed a type of macrocytes, and by macrocytes simply mean a large red cell, so our MCV greater than 96. So now you can see our, our range coming into play, 80 to 96 for the MCV. But in megaloblasts, what you see is a specific type of cell in which nuclear maturation is delayed. And the cause of this is usually vitamin B12 or folate deficiency. And the reason this happens is that these uh, vitamins are very, very important um, in allowing DNA synthesis in red cells. And if they're not there, the sort of synthetic cellular processes can become deranged and red cells can keep on producing lots and lots of protein and make them very, very big. Um, on the other hand, um, in non-megaloblastic anemia, where also uh, the size of the cell is enlarged, they are macrocytes, we don't see these, these, these aberrations in nuclear maturation and development. Um, and it's important to be aware of some of the other causes of macrocytosis, uh, non-megaloblastic macrocytosis, such as excess alcohol ingestion, reticulocytosis, uh, and liver disease, but a little bit more on this later. So we've established megaloblastic anemia is not the same as macrocytosis. It's a subtype. Vitamin B12 and folate are needed for cell maturation and their absence leads to a overall reduced cell output because essentially those, those cells that are produced never get past, uh, get out of the bone marrow. But also we get abnormal cells sometimes that do get out and those are the ones that we will see under the microscope. Also, it's not just the red cell line that is affected in megaloblastic anemia. These nutrients are important in other cell lines as well. So going through, we've already said, you get red cells uh, that are macrocytic, so large in size. You also get abnormalities of neutrophils, particularly this abnormality called hypersegmented neutrophils. And if severe enough, you can actually get a reduction in the number coming out of the bone marrow, so-called leukopenia. And you can also get reductions in platelets as well, a thrombocytopenia. Here is an example of an abnormal neutrophil, a hypersegmented neutrophil, where there's greater than six lobes to the nucleus. And this is particularly associated with this group of megaloblastic anemias. So let's go through each vitamin in turn. First, vitamin B12 deficiency.
In order to understand vitamin B12 deficiency and the causes of it, you need to basically understand how vitamin B12 is absorbed. There are a number of key steps, and the two key places that these occur are the stomach and the terminal ileum. Once vitamin B12 is absorbed in the stomach, there is a binding with intrinsic factor, which is produced by the gastric parietal cells. This complex of vitamin B12 and intrinsic factor then goes through the entire uh, small intestine and is absorbed in the terminal ileum. In terms of causes of vitamin B12 deficiency, you can get a B12 deficiency due to reduced intake, but this really isn't very common as the body tends to have quite large reserves of vitamin B12. Um, so you really only see it in those with very, very poor diets, such as very, very strict vegans. Much more common is impaired absorption of vitamin B12, either due to a problem in the stomach, where you get that intrinsic factor being produced, or in the terminal ileum, where you're getting the absorption of those uh, vitamin B12 intrinsic factor complexes. The most common cause in the stomach is after the stomach's been removed, say post-gastrectomy. And the most common cause in the ileum, or ileum, is uh, Crohn's disease, particularly Crohn's disease associated with terminal ileitis an ileal resection, and finally pernicious anemia. Now, of all the causes of vitamin B12 deficiency, pernicious anemia is probably the most common. So I want to go through this a little bit now. In pernicious anemia, the problem essentially is you get autoimmune attack on the gastric parietal cells. This leads to an atrophic gastritis, so an atrophic inflammation of the stomach, which the end result is you get lack of intrinsic factor being produced. If you've got no intrinsic factor, you're not getting the formation of those intrinsic factor vitamin B12 complexes, so you're not getting as much absorption in the terminal ileum. Diagnostically, on a blood test, you see a reduced serum vitamin B12. And obviously you see other things as well, such as a raised MCV, macrocytosis, etc. You also sometimes see autoantibodies, particularly two types of autoantibodies, the antiparietal cell autoantibodies in 90% and anti-intrinsic factor antibodies in about 50% of patients with this condition. Common to this group of patients are other autoimmune diseases, um, such as, for example, thyroid disease. You should also know that the presence of pernicious anemia and atrophic gastritis predisposes to the formation of gastric adenocarcinoma. This is a theme, this association between inflammation and malignancy is a theme we're going to come back to in later podcasts. In terms of clinical features, you might see uh, clinical features of anemia, as we discussed earlier, but specific to vitamin B12 deficiency are a certain set of features. Probably most common is a peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and you see this quite early with just pins and needles um, and a glove and stocking distribution in the peripheries. This can, if allowed to progress, start to involve the posterior and lateral columns of the spinal cord, leading to a condition called subacute combined degeneration. This results in loss of vibration, proprioception, and indeed if it gets worse can lead to weakness and quite profound ataxia. For those who are really keen, vitamin B12 has also been associated with optic atrophy, um, dementia and weight loss, quite profound weight loss due to the effect that vitamin deficiency has on intestinal mucosal cells. But that's really aside, the main thing is peripheral neuropathy, subacute combined degeneration. In terms of treatment, the treatment of choice is hydroxycobalamin, which is basically vitamin B12. The problem with this is you have to give it um, as an intramuscular injection. There isn't an oral formulation uh, that is available. One thing to really be aware of with vitamin B12 is that it should always be given with folate. And the reason for this is uh, if you start someone on folate without giving them vitamin B12 and they have one of these underlying or they have an underlying deficiency of vitamin B12, you can actually precipitate some of those neurological complications we spoke about earlier. So always consider folate and vitamin B12 together. A little bit now on folate deficiency. 
Once again, we can take a rational approach to the causes of folate deficiency. It could be because of dietary factors, and actually this is a much more common situation than vitamin B12, as the body reserves of folate are quite low. So you'll see folate deficiency developing in months rather than years. Good sources of folate in the diet are things such as spinach, broccoli, and some types of offal. You can see it as a malabsorption phenomenon, say for example in small bowel disease such as Crohn's. You can see it due to an increased demand, and this is particularly the case during one pregnancy, and two, some of the myeloproliferative and hemolytic anemias, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. And then finally, some drugs have an antifolate action and can cause a relative folate deficiency. The most important examples of these are methotrexate, alcohol, and some of the anticonvulsant medications. The key diagnostic test is a reduced red cell folate. Note the red cell bit before the folate. Um, with vitamin B12, it's the serum vitamin B12, but for folate, it's the red cell folate. The treatment is with oral folate. You can give folate orally, but always remember the vitamin B12. So what I want to do now is talk very briefly about anemia of chronic disease. This is something that you will see lots and lots of. Essentially, what happens with chronic diseases is that you get cytokine-induced failure of the transfer of iron from reticular endothelial cells in the bone marrow to normoblasts as the red cells are developing. This happens in this group of three conditions. Obviously, there's lots of lots of conditions, but you can broadly group them all together into these three main processes. So chronic infection, say for example TB, infective endocarditis. Chronic inflammatory conditions, examples here might be rheumatoid arthritis, SLE or Crohn's, and nearly all types of malignancy can also cause this. It can actually be very difficult, based on the four blood count and the hematinics, to diagnose an anemia of chronic disease and it's something that really is more suspected based upon the history. The hemoglobin will of course be low because it's an anemia. The MCV can either be normal or it can sometimes be low. Note however that on a blood film um, even though you might see microcytosis and hypochromic red cells this is rarely as severe as an iron deficiency anemia. The ferritin may be normal, it may indeed be raised, because in all of these conditions you get an acute phase response. And if you remember earlier, we mentioned that ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So what about treatment? The usual treatment for an anemia of chronic disease that is uh, causing disability to the patient or problems is to give erythropoietin uh, injections subcutaneously. However, some groups of patients end up having regular blood transfusions to maintain um, themselves asymptomatic. Okay, so we've looked at insufficient production. Now let's have a look at inefficient production. The first condition to consider, and I only want to consider this very briefly, we'll look at this more in the third podcast on the myeloproliferative conditions, is myelodysplasia. This is a condition mainly of the elderly. It's a very mild malignancy of early myeloid progenitor cells. Um, and what it results in is both a quantitative, so that's the amount, and qualitative, so that's the quality, of the cell lines being affected. Um, in the bone marrow, if you were to do a bone marrow biopsy, there'd be increased cellularity and abnormal myeloid precursors. And the problem with this condition is there's a risk of blastic transformation in about 30% to acute myeloid leukemia, usually. More on this in the third podcast, but it is worth bearing in mind for this uh, group of conditions. More commonly, and this is basically the whole thing here, is bone marrow infiltration. So when you have destruction in the bone marrow or when you have another cell line proliferating that competes with normal bone marrow, you can get this type of anemia. Broadly, we can divide bone marrow infiltration into a cellular problem or a hypocellular problem. 
So in cellular, it basically means that there are other cells there that are preventing the bone marrow carrying out its normal function. So, for example, this might be a primary issue such as myeloproliferation or myelofibrosis, or it could be secondary due to the bone marrow being involved due to malignant spread from elsewhere. In the next group, the actual quality, the actual amount of the cells have been reduced, so that's hypocellular. And this, once again, can be primary and idiopathic and secondary due to certain sort of other things. And these are the really key things for hypocellular a bone marrow failure you need to know about. So cytotoxic drugs, radiotherapy, infections, particularly parvovirus B19, and lastly, immune-based phenomena such as the graft versus host disease, which we're going to discuss more extensively in the immunology podcasts. This is the characteristic triad. You see a pancytopenia, so a lack of cells of all types, of all the different lines. So if you look at the red cell line, you get an anemia, the white cell line, a neutropenia, and the platelet line, a thrombocytopenia. You also get a classical blood film, the so-called leukoerythroblastic film, where you see immature red and white cells or blasts. Okay, so in that quick half hour, we've actually covered quite a lot. So I think it's worth just going back and doing a quick summary on those things. So remember, we can talk about anemia in terms of reduced production. That's one of our categories, with the other one being increased destruction. But under reduced production, we can subclassify into insufficient production. So there aren't enough of the raw materials. So that's iron, vitamin B12, and folate. Or we can have inefficient production because the process of making the cells has been disturbed, usually because there's a problem with the bone marrow itself, either a cellular problem or a hypocellular problem. So let's move on now to talk about anemias due to increased destruction of red cells. This increased destruction is called hemolysis, which basically means an anemia where there is a reduction in the red cell lifespan. Once again, you're going to see lots of classification systems for hemolysis. Um, the one that probably you're most commonly seen referred to in the textbooks is this classification of extravascular hemolysis and intravascular hemolysis. It's basically exactly what it says on the tin. Extravascular is where um, you're having the hemolysis or the breakdown of those red cells occurring outside the bloodstream. And usually this is in the spleen, mediated by splenic macrophages. In intravascular hemolysis, on the other hand, you're getting the, the breakdown occurring in the blood itself. It's worth saying, however, that there's often some crossover between these two things and that the extravascular process in nearly all conditions is much more important. So what about the clinical features of hemolysis? They're highly variable. Some patients with a hemolytic problem will have absolutely no uh, anemia at all. Some patients will develop a chronic hemolytic anemia, often in association with folate deficiency, and we'll talk about why this is the case in a bit. And then one of the key features of hemolytic anemias is, is the propensity to develop acute episodes or acute hemolytic episodes or crises, um, and sometimes to go on to develop problems with the bone marrow itself, sometimes even an aplastic anemia. In terms of the actual uh, blood features to look for, they're pretty much the same in all types of hemolytic anemia, and this is therefore a really, really important list to learn. You'll see a raised, unconjugated bilirubin, a reduced haptoglobin. Haptoglobin is a protein that binds free hemoglobin in the bloodstream and is then removed by reticular endothelial cells. So if you're getting lots of this binding, lots of this removal, your levels of that will be low in a hemolytic process. You see a raised LDH, you see a raised urinary urobelinogen, and finally you see presence of young cells or reticular sites in large amounts in the blood, and this bluish tinge to the film which is called polychromasia. Those five features are really, really important. If you see any of those, start 
thinking, ah, could this be a hemolytic process that's occurring? This is just to illustrate this reticulocytosis. Reticulocytes are large, immature red cells. There should be less than 2% present. There should be less than 2% of cells on any blood film. Um, and greater than this indicates a reticulocytosis. Um, often uh, the presence of large amounts of reticulocytes, because they are large cells, can cause a mild macrocytosis to be present um, in the blood. Also note that there tends to be a bluish tinge to these cells, um, and this is called polychromasia. So we've already spoken about one of the classification systems of hemolytic anemias, that of extravascular and intravascular. A much more useful way of actually dividing up these anemias is to consider them in terms of where the problem lies. Is it a problem with the red cell itself or a problem occurring outside the red cell primarily which is then affecting the red cell? The intrinsic red cell problems tend to be inherited and this we're talking about problems such as G6PD, pyruvate kinase deficiency, things like that. On the other hand, conditions such as autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which are occurring outside the cell, tend to be acquired. The one exception that you need to be aware of here is that there's this condition called PNH, or paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which is the only intrinsic red cell condition that is actually acquired. So let's start by talking about these inherited um, hemolytic conditions. As I said before, they're inherited, so they're problems with the red, cell them, red cells themselves. And the problems can be on the cell membrane, the cell cytoplasm, or the hemoglobin itself. There are lots and lots of conditions, but these are the key ones you need to know about. For the membrane, you need to know about hereditary spherocytosis and elliptocytosis. For the cytoplasm, uh, G6PD. For the hemoglobin, sickle cell anemia, and the thalassemias. So what I want to do now is not give you a really in-depth analysis of each of these conditions, but just a little bit of revision and a quick overview of these important inherited intracellular conditions. So let's start at the cell membrane. We've got spherocytosis and elliptocytosis. In both of these conditions, there's a problem with the spectrin or anchorin proteins on the cell membrane. This leads to a reduced red cell lifespan as it tends to cause the cells to have an abnormal shape. And this abnormal shape leads to trapping of these cells, particularly in the spleen and premature phagocytosis by splenic macrophages. Both spherocytosis and elliptocytosis are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Spherocytosis is much more common and much more severe compared to elliptocytosis, which tends to be quite rare and quite mild. Test-wise, um, one of the key tests, of course, is a blood film. And um, on, uh, in, in spherocytosis, you'll see uh, spherocytes, and in elliptocytosis, uh, you'll see elliptocytes. There's an additional test called the osmotic fragility test, which is often used in the diagnosis of spherocytosis. In terms of treatment, because elliptocytosis is quite uh, mild, uh, no treatment tends to be needed. But in spherocytosis, because of this, this role that the spleen has, sometimes the spleen is removed in a splenectomy, and as with all hemolytic anemias, folate supplementation should be given. If we move on now to talk about problems in the cell cytoplasm, we come to glucose 6-dehydrogenase deficiency, or um, G6PD deficiency. And here, the problem basically is, is that the cells are, are lacking um, in one of the key enzymes needed to produce um, NADPH. Now, NADPH is used with another uh, substance called glutathione to protect the cell from oxidative damage. And uh, in, in the absence of this, uh, cells are much more fragile, much more likely to have a reduced lifespan. The condition is X-linked, and it's most common in Africans, Mediterraneans, and uh, Chinese populations. In terms of the clinical syndromes, 
Um, it causes, it can cause a chronic hemolytic picture, but much more characteristic are acute hemolytic, often self-limiting episodes of hemolysis caused by a precipitant that places oxidative stress on the cells. The important three classes are drugs, fava beans and infection. And the, t uh, the two key groups of drugs you need to be aware of here are antimalarials and uh, sulfonamides. On the blood film, there are some characteristic changes that you should be able to recognize, at least by name. These are Heinz bodies, which are little cellular inclusions, and bite cells, which literally are um, red cells which, which seem to have had a bite taken out of them. If you want to uh, diagnose this condition definitively, you can do this Beutler fluorescent spot test, which essentially measures the G6PD content of the cells. It's important to note that this test should only be done um, when the patient is outside of an acute episode. Okay, so we've looked at disorders of the outside of the cell, we've looked at disorders of the cytoplasm, now finally, let's look at the very common disorders of haemoglobin, namely sickle cell disease and thalassemia. So a quick revision of sickle cell disease and sickle cell disease, you have a point mutation in one of the codons of the beta globin chain. This can result or be inherited um, in either a homozygous way or heterozygous way. And the homozygous form is what is now termed as sickle cell disease and the heterozygous is termed sickle cell trait. The problem with having homozygous uh, uh, genotype is that HBS, which is a type of haemoglobin that's formed as a result of this, is very insoluble at low oxygen tensions. And therefore, when the cells precipitate, there's reduced flexibility, the cells become very rigid, and they can cause hypoxia locally by blocking small vasculature. The other thing that's important to remember is that this process of sickling is precipitated by three key things, infection, dehydration, and hypoxia. And indeed, this forms the basis of management of these patients when they come in having a, a crisis. In sickle cell disease, there are two basic problems. Because the cells are abnormal, they have a shortened survival. They're often taken up by splenic macrophages, for example. Um, so the cells have a shortened uh, survival and there's a chronic hemolytic state that develops. As part of chronic hemolysis, you can see splenomegaly because the spleen is very active, so it enlarged enlarges. You see gallstones because of those high concentrations of unconjugated uh, bilirubin. You see folate deficiency and you also find that patients are vulnerable to aplastic anemia. You, however, on the other hand, the other big problem is these vaso-occlusive uh, crises, essentially where the cells sickle, there's impaired passage of those cells through the microcirculation and obstruction of small vessels that may be severe enough to cause infarction. And this leads to acute episodes and long-term problems as well with various organs. Common uh, problems following crises are bone pain, osteomyelitis, particularly with the organism Salmonella, dactylitis, so that's problems with the, the fingers, this is very common in kids, priapism can be seen, lower limb ulceration, changes in the eyes, retinopathy, and kidney problems such as tubular interstitial nephritis. There are two very important life-threatening complications of sickle cell crisis that are basically because the microvasculature is being affected in, in core organ systems. Um, the common ones are pulmonary syndrome, um, which if recurrent can lead to pulmonary hypertension, and stroke. In terms of diagnosis, sickle cell disease is quite an easy thing to diagnose. Um, with uh, HB electrophoresis and if you do HB electrophoresis you'll find a single band of HBS rather than uh, the two of HBS and HBA that you might say find in sickle cell trait. 
You can also do sickle cell solubility tests as well as a quick method for diagnosing sickle cell disease. In terms of treatment, it depends upon which exact clinical presentation the patient has, but in an acute sickle crisis, you're trying to address those precipitants as that I mentioned earlier. So you're trying to keep the patient warm, um, you're trying to give fluids to prevent dehydration, and you're treating any infection that might be there, perhaps with antibiotics. In terms of prevention of complications of sickle cell disease, vaccination is very important as these patients often lack a spleen. Penicillin prophylaxis once again and folate, as with all hemolytic disease, should be given as a supplement. Hydroxyurea has a particular role therapeutically in treatment of sickle cell disease as it's been shown to increase the levels of HBF, which slows clinical course of the disease. So that's sickle. Let's talk now a little bit about thalassemia. Now the problem in thalassemia is that you've got an imbalanced alpha and beta globin chain production. And this leads to two essential problems. One, the red blood cells can't synthesize properly. And two, those red blood cells that are synthesized have a reduced lifespan. Thalassemia is found in nearly every racial group, but it's particularly common in people from Mediterranean regions, Africa, Middle East, Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia. There are two broad types. There's alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia. Alpha thalassemia is where you have a lack of some of the alpha globin chains, and this is mostly because of gene deletions. And in beta thalassemia, it's because you've got a lack of the beta globin chains. And this is mainly because of point mutations. Beta thalassemia is probably the most common. There are two types, beta thalassemia major, which is consistent with the homozygous state, and beta thalassemia minor or intermediate, which is consistent with the heterozygous state. Beta thalassemia major tends to present quite early in life and requires blood transfusion, while beta thalassemia minor is generally asymptomatic. There might be a mild hemolytic picture, but those group of patients tend to do quite well. In terms of features, we see a severe anemia in thalassemia major that's often um, displaying very early in life. We also see evidence of extramedullary hematopoiesis, both in the liver and the spleen, and also within the bones themselves, which lead to bony expansion. This can result in uh, a number of features that are characteristic of this condition. So, of course, you get the, the anemia. You can also get bony deformities because of this extramedullary uh, hematopoiesis. You get frontal bossing, bones that are malleable, prone to fracture. You also get problems with iron accumulation, usually because of the treatment that's required for the anemia with repeated blood transfusions. You get problems with the gonads leading to failure of sexual development, problems with the pancreas due to iron deposition causing diabetes, problems with the liver, hepatic dysfunction, and also problems with the heart leading to cardiac dysfunction. Alpha thalassemia is less common than beta thalassemia. There are four important alpha genes and the severity of alpha thalassemia depends upon the number that are deficient. So if you have all four deficient, this is incompatible with life. There is cardiac failure in utero resulting in high drops fetalis and, and uh, the baby dies. If there are three um, lacking, then you get hemoglobin H disease which is probably most common and gives you moderate anemia and splenomegaly. And then a one or two, you're looking at an asymptomatic picture, perhaps with some mild anemia. So that was just a quick overview of the major hemoglobinopathies, sickle cell disease, and alpha and beta thalassemia. So let's now look at acquired hemolysis. As mentioned previously, these acquired defects tend to be due to a problem outside the cell. They can be subclassified into immune hemolysis and non-immune hemolysis.
In immune hemolysis, we're looking at autoantibody problems and also alloantibody problems, such as in a mismatched blood transfusion or in neonatal alloimmune hemolysis. In non-immune hemolysis, we're looking at traumatic mechanical um, problems resulting in hemolysis and this condition PNH, paroxysmal or nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Let's start by talking about the common group, that immune hemolysis. This condition is probably most important, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The problem here is that there is the production of autoimmune antibodies against red cells, leading to red cell hemolysis. And the red cells themselves hemolyze both intravascularly and extravascularly, most commonly in the spleen. In this group of patients, there's often a history of other autoimmune conditions, such as thyroid uh, disease, uh, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. Occasionally, however, this condition may also be seen with drugs and other lymphoproliferative disorders. The key features are features of hemolysis, so that's all the clinical things we spoke about before, all the biochemical, hematological test features we spoke about before. And very importantly, they will have this, a positive direct anti-globulin um, uh, test, or uh, DAT, or something called a Coombs test. There are two broad types of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, warm and cold. And this really depends upon the, the temperature at which um, the autoantibodies are reactive with the cells. Um, warm tends to be IgG mediated and cold tends to be IgM mediated. Warm, however, is much more common than cold. Note that they have very different sets of causes and these causes are uh, is a list that you really, really should try and remember. For warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, you're looking at idiopathic, you're looking at autoimmune disorders, particularly lupus, myeloproliferative disorders, particularly the um, CLL and lymphoma, and drugs, particularly three types of drugs, penicillins, methyl dopa, and quinine. On the cold side, you're looking at infections as an important group, particularly Epstein-Barr virus and mycoplasmal infection, and also lymphoma. The key clinical features are quite variable, um, with some patients having features of a chronic anemia with subclinical disease, and some patients indeed presenting with um, acute episodes. In terms of treatments, steroids are used for their immunosuppressive effects to induce remission um, with an acute episode. Um, and then if relapse occurs, more uh, pr profound immunosuppression is often needed. Sometimes splenectomy is needed if um, hemolytic anemia does not improve with steroids. However, note that this is not effective for patients with cold hemolytic anemia as most cells tend to be destroyed in the liver rather than the spleen. I shall be considering the alloimmune hemolytic anemias um, in other podcasts so we're going to skip on from here. So this other group is non-immune hemolysis. Basically the problem in non-immune hemolysis is that the red cells are suffering some sort of trauma um, in narrow damaged vessels or by products of coagulation that have been deposited um, in those vessels. And the three real groups that um, fall under this broad category are microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or MAHA, which include these uh, conditions of disseminated intravascular coagulation, um, HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. These three conditions are going to be considered uh, in more detail in the next hematology podcast on bleeding disorders, so I'm not going to go into them in detail here, but the essence is you get abnormal products of coagulation deposited in vessels, which leads to mechanical damage to red cells. You could also get damage to the red cells with artificial heart valves, and in this condition called March hemoglobinuria, 
where uh, repeated trauma uh, can cause um, damage to red cells. The characteristic feature of this are the schistocytes which are seen on the blood film and, and this essentially makes sense. These, these cells have been damaged um, by their passage through the microcirculation. So the last thing in this podcast, I want to consider that exception that we mentioned before. That exception was paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which is an acquired mutation of pig A or of the pig A gene within one of the stem cells. This results in a red cell defect, which results in problems with the cell surface uh, proteins. It affects all cell lines. The triad for this that you need to try and remember are features of intravascular hemolysis, not extravascular, but intravascular hemolysis, features of clotting, so venous thrombosis, you can get DVTs, you can get pulmonary embolisms, you can get strokes, and hemoglobinuria, most common in the night time or in the morning. It can be diagnosed using something called a HAMS test, which is not really any longer used, but used to be positive because this group of cells tended to lies at uh, a lower pH, as lower pH pHs tend to favor uh, the activation of complement. Much more common now is to use cytometric analysis um, to look at the cell surface proteins that are abnormal, particularly the cell surface protein anti-CD59. Treatment is mainly through supplementation, such as folate supplementation, anticoagulation to deal with the increased risk of thrombosis, and um, there are some newer monoclonal antibodies, um, such as eculizumab, um, which act against C5, which is one of the complement uh, components to reduce the complement-mediated hemolysis that occurs um, in this condition. Right, so... Just to recap once again, in the second half of the podcast, we've looked at anemias that are due to increased destruction. We've seen how these can be broken down into congenital or inherited and acquired. We've seen how most acquired problems tend to be problems arising outside the red cell, usually to do with antibodies or damage within red cells. And we've seen how the other group can be due to uh, problems of the red cells themselves inside the red cells, either due to a problem with the, the membrane in spherocytosis and elliptocytosis, problems with the cytoplasm in G6PD, problems with the haemoglobin in the haemoglobinopathies of sickle cell disease and thalassemia. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast. If you have any feedback, please get in contact uh, directly through um, the website. Thanks for listening and see you soon.